What's going on, everybody? I'd like to welcome y'all back to the Diagnosis Success Podcast, where we talk about motivation, inspiration, dedication, and as always, tapping into your higher self. And just want to thank all the listeners, man. It's been phenomenal, man. Subscribers is through the roof. Shout out to all of y'all. And today, we got a fire, dynamic guest, man. This is my brother, man. He is just prolific. He's a businessman, investor. I mean, he does it all, man. He's a mentor. He's a teacher. It is no other than Storm Leroy. Storm, what's up, bro? Oh, man. Thank you for the intro, brother. I greatly appreciate it. Uh, for a minute, I was looking around going, who, who are you talking about? <laughs> I want to watch this one. I'm sticking around for this one. You know what I mean? I greatly appreciate it, though, family. Yo, listen, mo most definitely, man. And we're excited to have you today, man, because, you know, we always like to focus on just brothers and sisters that's just doing dynamic things, man. And just what you're doing, where you've been, where you're going. Definitely, man, this, this is a phenomenal interview, man. So once again, thank you, brother. And, um, you know, I, I gave a brief overview, man, but you do a lot of stuff, man. So for the listeners that's just tapping in for the first time to you, just tell them, like, who is Storm Leroy? Wow. Storm Leroy, man. I'm, I'm uh, from Brooklyn, New York. I've always, my mindset was always to um, be an entrepreneur and to get into that world of not wanting to do something for somebody else. You know, even at a young age, for me, it came with my dad, really, I watched my dad work, work construction, worked real hard. He, um, in Brooklyn, there's a hospital called Woodhall Hospital. And Woodhall Hospital, you know, back in the 70s, it was the same day labor where they would be outside and mostly blacks outside by the construction site. You have to get picked to work. So my, my pops, fortunately, was real big. Like, you know, he's one of them, he's short and stocky like Rocky, <laughs> you know, so they would pick my dad to work. So while he was doing a uh, dig, digging a ditch, the ditch collapsed on him, caved them in. So from the waist down, like from the chest down, he was covered in mud, you know what I mean? So they just brought him back home. In fact, bringing them back home back then, it was, you know, there was no unions, there was no representation. It was like, yo, you got hurt, you ain't even supposed to be here. So they dropped them off at the kitchen table. And, um, but prior to that, he would always have me take his boots off. So on this same day, when they brought him in, he called me in to take his boots off. So I take his boots off and he looked down at me. And he says, you know why I have you take my boots off? Now, I remember he's in pain and covered. So I look up at him. I'm about eight years old, mm -hmm. eight years old. So I go, why? He says, so you don't have to go through what I'm going through. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? So that hit me. You know, even though I, I was that young, I knew he was giving me a message just by sincerity to look in his eyes. So moving forward now, I knew that he saw something in me particularly because I was always into electronics, you know, like the Commodore 64 computers. I'm gonna take you back, stuff you don't even take remember. Take it back, take it back to you the You know, there was a Tandy computer <laughs> with the floppy disk about this big, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And I was always into learning how to do that stuff. And I was always into business, have a, like a, open up a bank account, selling things, selling baseball cards. So he would always talk to me about business. And another thing he would always tell me is don't pay anybody's mortgage. Mm. Don't pay anybody's mortgage. And we didn't even own our home. Mm. But, you know, people who know back then in the 70s, there was redlining. There was, there was mm. a thing where we couldn't get mortgage. You know, my father came from the South, and my mother, but my father had like, um, like a, a, a fifth, sixth grade education. You know, my mother actually mm. taught him basically how to continue his education with reading and writing. You wow. know what I mean? But my father was always a strong worker. And that was back when the, the mother could stay home and the father works and my mom was always there for us. So once I got out into the world, I rented my, my, my first place and I was like, yo, this, this don't feel good. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, I know I'm paying somebody's mortgage, paying that rent mm -hmm. and the control that they had over me. And then I knew basically he was saying that ownership is power. Ownership is power. And I was exchanging my time for money working and that wasn't cool. So now I said, you know what? I want to get into this real estate game of owning, owning something. So that's when I went looking for my first place and stuff like that, you know, and um, I, I could keep going, man, if you want to jump in and catch the points. Listen, I, man, know. listen, listen, I man, this, go, this, man, this is what the listeners want, man. You know, they, okay. they want them gems, man. Look, we call it the jewelry store. You got the gems, brother. <laughs> you yeah. know what I'm saying? So keep going, man, because you said you, you right. found you found the first uh, piece of real estate. So where was it? Because I know you, you from Brooklyn. Was it in yeah. Brooklyn? Like, you know, how much was it? Like, what was the dynamics of that? What that looked like? All right, yeah, so let me pick back up there from there. I'll keep going. So mm -hmm. now um, 
I realized I wanted to really buy real estate. And this was in 1995. Okay. 95, I wanted to get into real estate. But the biggest mistake I did when I was going to look at properties was I took two people with me who didn't see the vision that I saw. You know, I went to go, there was this older gentleman around Bergen and Washington area, for those that I know, Brooklyn. So, and over there is worth buku dollars. So he wanted to sell me two of his brownstones for 300 and something thousand dollars, like two of them. So I'm over there looking collectively, at Collectively, the wait, 300,000 a piece or collectively both of them? Both of them. Wow. One to wow. some both, you know what I mean? But it was a lot of crack. And another thing, the basement, I caught on fire in one of them, right? Mm -hmm. So he wanted to sell one, but he was gonna throw in the other one because of the damage. Like the basement, it still had tenants, but the basement had a, had a fire. And I'm telling my brothers like, yo man, I could get this, you know, I'm telling brothers like, yo, I could do this. And they like, yo, you see the drugs, you see what's going on, plus it was a fire over here. I'm like, bro, I still could get rent from this one right here that's rented. And the other one that still had a basement and a fire in the basement still had a tenant. I'm like, yo, I want to do this. I just don't, but they convinced me. They found one reason to make my list of a hundred reasons to do it, not to do it. One reason out of all that list. So it's so intricate to have the right people around you who think like you think and see the vision you see. You know what I mean? So because all it takes, like I said, once they told me don't do it, I didn't buy the property. And I was kicking myself ever mm. since. But in 99, um, that's when I said to myself, I linked up with a friend of mine who was a, a, a realtor buying property. He was buying properties and doing agents. And I said, y'all want to buy real estate, man. This is what I got to do. That's what's like in my vein. You know what I mean? It's like pookie and crack. It was like just endless, endless. You're calling me. He's <laughs> calling me. So I was like, yo, yo, bro, I got to get this property. It's like, no, nah, I'm, I'm, I got a spot over here in bed style. You know, you want to come look at the spot. I was like, bet. I went to go look at it. And um, a family was living there. I said, yo, I'm, but they was going to move out. So I was getting it from, from my primary residence. So I was like, yo, I want this spot. He's like, yo, you, you got to do this, man, because this is happening in bed style. This, you don't see it now, but it's coming. They're going to invest money. Da, da, da. And back then, they was offering to buy houses for a dollar and five dollars. Lots. For dollar and five dollars, you know it's this. Crazy. Is, you know when HUD came in, but we didn't see the value in our properties because of all the drugs. And I get it. When you look out your window and all you see is the drugs, robberies, you're gonna go. I'm not. I'm trying to get out of here. Mm -hmm. But see, they had a bigger plan. And this is where being in contact with your community, have the, having uh the, the meetings, knowing what's going on with these in your community, is so important. Then you will see what's about to happen, and you can be involved. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You can't you can't say to yourself, yo, I would have, would have, would have if you wasn't staying up on the information of what's about to happen. Mm -hmm. There's no way, you know, being being a renter. Um, I can't be mad at people when they say, oh, back then, you know, we should have, we should have, we should have. I'm not mad at them. What I'm saying is we wasn't informed. There was a bigger plan that was made for us not to buy. So it can look like what our urban areas are looking like now. This was designed to go, Facts. yo, we're going to take these houses from them. Don't Facts. let them know. So mm -hmm. I'm not mad at them older people at all. But mm -hmm. what I am saying is now, 20 years, not even 20, about 10 years ago, five years ago, like you saw it happening. But instead of people saying, now I want to buy, you're being upset at the kind of people that are moving in the neighborhood. You see what I mean? You, they, they, what they did was transfer the frustration from older people who didn't know in the 80s or the 70s and 80s, and now transfer that over to the people who don't look like us. Oh, yo, they got these, mm -hmm. these kind of people moving in. Nah, that's whack. Okay, you gotta say to yourself, yo, if I see this, this white chick running down the block in a neighborhood with all black people jogging, what's going on here? That's a fact. That's you a know, fact. You gotta start questioning what's happening and not being saying, yo, they trying to do this to us or they trying to take our neighbor, go, yo, how can I invest in this before it changes? and I'm no longer, I'm no longer priced in, I'm being priced out, you feel mm -hmm. me? So that's when I bought the first brownstone in 99 and when I gutted that brownstone out, the main thing for me, now I started working for the telephone company in 96. So once I start gutting out this property, main thing I realized was time management. Another thing my dad was teaching me about. Time management. I'm gutting out this place and I had a job. So I had to go to work, come back, or a lot of times take my vacation, sick time to be at this brownstone, to do this renovation, to do all this beautiful thing that we hear about, which is great. 
fixing, fixing and flipping, all that is great. But if you don't have a job, you don't have that time to allot to it and you trust in somebody else, now there's a problem. That's a problem. You're jeopardizing your continuous livelihood of guaranteed money to be at this site of a construction that you know is going to be your primary residence because either you don't have the right people to trust them. And just to interject, you said something, man, that I love, man. I, I saw in the interview, you said, man, don't look at your job as something that's negative. Your job is your first business partner. And I love that. You know what I'm saying? Because it's like, that's that's a that's a winner's mentality. It's like, instead of me seeing this as something that's a hindrance to me, that's holding me back, let me leverage this money that I'm getting consistently to build upon my empire. You know what yep. I'm saying? So it's like, yes. yo, when you clock in your job, all right, you get that paper. But when you clock out, you clocking into your real job, which is you working for yourself. So exactly. I love that, man. But I just had to insert, because I love nah, it. Man. No like, doubt, no, bro. No. Look, that's a major key, because think about this, you know, a lot of times when you hear about entrepreneurs and people doing this and people encouraging you to be an entrepreneur, to, 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 to value yourself, they telling you value yourself more than your job, right? Mm -hmm. But the key is, okay, tell me now how to execute. Because it sounds like to me, you telling me to quit my job. Sounds like you telling me the job don't appreciate me. Leave there and go out on the limb. You, you got to risk it all if you want it all. If you want to make this happen, you just got to say, you know what? There is no failure. There is no, you know, they give you all that pep talk. You got to be 100% committed. You can't be one foot in, one foot out. You, I'll be like, oh, y'all buying this? Y'all buying that right there. This check, that's paying your rent, your mortgage, food, everything. He's telling you, risk it all, go out there, drop the mic, and now you're on your own. He ain't telling you, yo, I'm going to work with you, or how to supplement the income, or all of, and I don't knock inspirational speech, speakers, right? Don't, but y'all are inspiring people to do what? You get what I'm saying? You, I'm inspiring you, I got you hyped, but now I don't tell you what to, I don't tell you how to execute. I just got you hyped to go out there and go, now what I'm gonna do? <laughs> Your you lights is off, <laughs> you eating oodles and noodles. <laughs> that don't work. What they need to yeah. do is give you balance. Balance is what's needed when you're talking to someone about their goals of what to do. It's like, okay, cool. You got that job. That's your livelihood. Look at it as your first business partner. Start learning how to master that as a business partner. So when you actually do get business partners, you now know how to do, how to now uh, transfer into that world. This job, I got to give him this much time, but in turn, he's giving me money. Of course, I don't like my business partner right now. He want me to do all this extra work, but you know what? I'm gonna find me some new business partners, but I'm gonna take that bread and my time to dedicate to do this. One of the key things, which is more than one, but it's one of the major key things that we don't have, we don't understand and I teach this and my mentors is time management. If you're willing to manage your time to give them eight hours, but when you understand you're not giving them eight hours, when you wake up in the morning, your alarm clock goes off, you're officially at work, bro. Cause you would not be waking up if it wasn't for that job. So now you woke up at six o'clock in the morning, you went to work, whatever time it gets you to get, get there. Then you say, all right, I'm off at five. No, you ain't off until you get back home because you still on a time once you left because you would not be leaving from that job. So a normal eight hour, eight hour day is consistent of 11 hours. Now, when you say, yo, I'm making $20 an hour, $30 an hour. Okay, that's for 40 hours a week, eight hours a day. But if you break that down to you making you doing 11 hours a day, you feel me? And now you nice. working 55 hours a week, that $20 an hour shrinks up to like 14 hours, 15 hours an hour. And mm -hmm. then you start going, all right, I definitely got to get out of this. Mm -hmm. So the whole thing is encouraging people with a plan, encouraging them, and that's what I do. I'm going to give you structure on how to, your job is your partner. I teach you time management, manage your time properly. When you do get off work, how to dedicate the remaining time of what you do have, how to take either one or two hours to focus on something. But see, you can't go straight into a plan. This is another thing I want to mention to people. You cannot go from your job to executing another plan until you have adjusted your mindset to what is that you're trying to do. Mm. See what I mean? People say, do this, do this, do this, do that. And now, boom, I tell you, yo, go over there and go, go buy houses, go do this and go do that. But you like, your mind isn't right. I'm telling you to leave this broken relationship to go be over here with somebody who's trying to be with you 
but you haven't got your mind right to prepare for that relationship over there of that person who goes, I'm not demanding, I'm understanding, I'm going to help you get there because your triggers are still there. Your triggers are still there. When that person might be one to encourage you, you might look at it as a sign of forceful telling you what you do. When they encourage you going, you can do this, but you're going, yo, don't be telling me what to do. It's right. a form of encouragement. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? So it's understanding. So when I teach people and I give them my class, I say, yo, you ain't learning about real estate today. You're learning about mindset, how to prepare yourself to come into this world because the success rate, of course, is a 7%. I'm striving for mine to be anywhere from 15 to 20 to 30%, eventually 50%. And mm -hmm. I know I can do that if I tap into your mindset first. And that's what all my mentees are getting now. They in the class together. We in a group together. They all sharing ideas together. You know, they get they, they got to know each other first before we start talking about real estate. Because now you picking out who you want to be your partner. Mm. The greatest growth in business is obtaining a partner that thinks like you. you feel that's me? fire. That's fire. And I mean, you, you dropped a lot of gems there, but that's key too. Collaboration is always greater than competition. A lot mm. of times, like you know, not to take it too deep, to take it back to slavery. But a lot of things were divisive back then, right? You know, gotcha. we had light skin versus dark skin. We had the field Negro versus the house Negro. You know, just constantly pitting minorities against each other. So when it's time for us to collaborate and build, we don't even know where to start, you know? Gotcha. So having that collaborative mentality to say, yo, you know what? We could build something together. You got a hammer. I got a screwdriver. What we doing? You know, so that that's what it is at the end of the day. So, I mean, just I, I just love it, man. Like, you know, because that's what this podcast is about, being yeah, successful, sure. tapping in. And like you said, too, man, knowledge, too. Like, it starts with the mentality, like to have mm -hmm. that mentality, to have structure and to be able just to plan your day. Because that's where a lot of people lose, too. It's like they get caught up in the rat race. Yep. Like you said, you got your commute to your job. Once you get to your job, then if you got a boss that's a jerk, you got to manage him. You got coworkers that's jerks. You got to manage them trying to do your job. Then you got to commute back home, depending yeah. what home life is like. If you got a family, you know what I'm saying? You got your spouse, you got your kids. So being able to compartmentalize your day to make it make sense and where you yeah. can still win. So that's I mean, mind. I, mm -hmm. you touch, you hitting it right. The mind, the mind, bro. But here's something else I want to throw out, right? When it comes to your job, and this is key. You know what I mean? Because this is why I like having discussions where we can now exchange ideas beyond real estate. Like I could talk about real estate three, four, five hours, but am I changing your mindset and am I changing your legacy? I'm not doing that because I'm talking to you about real estate and you probably heard about real estate since we were kids. But here's another thing. We are taught realistically in the job on how to be engineered to continue to work and transfer the mentality to our children to go get a job. Right? When you at work, and I'm gonna tell you this from experience in my job. When I, you know, would go to work and I first started, the key was field workers against the management. I worked outside. Yo, management ain't on your side. Management, you don't trust them. Man, we all stick together. Management, nah, you don't do this. Yep. And I'm saying to myself, you know, my supervisors and things like that, yo. These are not bad people. Why am I hate old boy? He, you know, he coming out to do his job, right? <laughs> and so most of like, them started with we, we the regular work. <laughs> a lot. But you know what I learned, man? This is where in-depth thinking comes into play. They don't want you to think like them. Because one of the supervisors, when I was first started, he was like, yo, I used to be out there in the field, man. But you know what I realized? I didn't want to be out there. I can make the same amount of money in here. And also I'm balancing my time and preparing to get out. Like mm -hmm. when you have the mentality and you're around a group of people who say, yo, this is a good job. We're going to stay here until we retire at 65. Think about that mentality. But when now you talk to a supervisor, somebody who's not outside, they have freedom and they say, yo, you know what? I'm, I have free time to go through something else. Yeah, I got somebody else on my back because I'm monitoring y'all. But I also have freedom to do other things. Like I have time to sit at this desk, start doing other, do school, do go to extra classes. Like I'm looking, going, why are y'all hating them when they really preparing themselves to get out? They don't have the protection of the union behind them, you know. And he was really coming up with a plan. So the 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 uh, divisiveness was scary to me. 
that somebody out there in the field was teaching me to be prepared to stay here till I'm 65 years old. I said, nah, man, I can't mess with y'all, bro. This is crazy. And then what you gonna do? Tell your kids, you, you're gonna bring them in nepotism. And now here, come work for the garbage company. Come work for the phone company. You gonna stay as long as I have. I wish I would. This is just me personally. Work for somebody for 30, 40 years, and then I retire at 60, 70 years old, and I got 10 years left to live, and I gave them 40. Don't get me wrong. I can understand why some people don't retire because either their their widow, their spouse died, you know, they 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 if they stay home, they're scared they're gonna die. So it's the camaraderie. I right. respect that. I respect that. But times and things are different now, bro. Way different. That's now. a fact. That's a fact. You know, and and there's a saying that I have, it's called tomorrow today. So what that means is that live your tomorrow today. Too many people they get caught up in, well, you know, 10 years from now, when I retire, I'm gonna travel. I'm going to live my best life. I'm going to do all this. Nah, tomorrow's not promised. You need to live your tomorrow today. Right you know, now. you got ambition, you got goals, you got aspirations. Start it today, man. You now, know, because like now. you said, it's a lot of that is generational too, Storm. Like, I feel like, especially like in minority communities, like you see grandpa, he had a good job at the bus company. So, yeah. you know what they tell, you know what I'm saying? Say, oh, be like grandpa, you know, go down there, get a good job with good benefits. And that's the plan until you retire. But then a lot of times, man, people don't even, they die on the job. They might retire what? a year later, they diagnosed with cancer. All kind of things happen and life happens. So ultimately you got to prepare yourself to say, you know what? I know what I want out of life. I'm not going to be a slave mentally to this job. Yes. You know, who ain't attached to me? Cause as soon as they get sick of you, they are going to replace you. You know security what I'm saying? Security is not there. Job security is not there like it was for our grandparents or for people like, you, you know, who had these jobs. These companies, especially now with COVID going, and you see what they're doing. They're like, if you don't get the shot, you fired. If you don't, companies are merging, merging together. They letting go workforce all day. You know, they surplus in all the time. My company went through that when I was working with them. They'd be like, look, we got to let y'all go. We don't care. That's how it go. So now that you got to look at technology is taking over everything. Remember we used to drive through the toll booth and give people money? How many people don't even realize that's not even there no more? What that's happened to those thousands of people? They're gone. They don't have a job. Amazon is now bought up Whole Foods. They have uh, supermarkets out in um, certain parts of California where you're going to be going through with your stuff in the bag, walk through a sensor, everything's paid for. No more cashiers. They doing that now at the Barclays. I was up in the Barclays. I go in there. Boom. I'm like, the gates open up. It goes by your American Express card. As soon as you walk through, you got American Express card, the door open up. You pick up stuff, walk out, rings up immediately. Like what? What do you think? Do, what do you think you're going to be able to do? That's going to be able to defeat technology, right? That's now, right. Here, here's a couple of things that I do always encourage people who do want to be in the field of working. That's not going away, in my opinion. If you want to be a home builder, robots not building houses. They not being plumbers. They are not being electrician. But here's the scary part: they don't teach you that. What's promoting that? Everything is promoting sitting home and making bread, which I'm fine with that. Talking, crypto, all that other stuff. But for those of you who know, your brain ain't cut out to be uh, on the high end of technology. Yo, go be a, go go get that um apprenticeship. Mm -hmm. Go learn that feel, electricians, plumber, that stuff right there, building houses, that ain't never going nowhere, man. That ain't never going nowhere. So another thing I'm gonna throw in because we've tapped in so much about real estate, you know, I, I like to teach people key things that I talk about. Business structure. And I have a thing that you probably heard of is the three must have LLCs. Like the importance of understanding your business structure is just as important as starting a business. A lot of people don't know that when you start your LLCs and you're working from home, um, you can write off, like in New York, you can write off 30% of your mortgage, 30% of your rent, light, gas, heating. They don't know you can write off depreciation on your vehicle. There's an app called Everlance that track your mileage. You can write all that stuff off with mileage. Think about 30% of your mortgage or even 30% of your rent. And that's another thing I encourage people also. You don't have to have the mindset of saying, oh, I can't buy real estate because I don't even own my own house. No, the FHAs and all that are great. And I always encourage those. But in places like New York, LA, FHA don't work in New York. If you want to buy you state, if you want a house hack and say, I want to buy a duplex. Duplex in New York is about $2 million. Two million, FHA for two million, three point five down, right? So twenty percent, so ten percent of, of two million. That's that's ten percent is twenty thousand. So now you got to put three percent. 
that's 60,000. Where a lot of people don't have 60,000, even a $2 million mortgage is $10,000 a month. You got to pay the other side of the, like the math don't work. So mm-hmm. people feel like they can't do it. So I tell them, think just like a CEO, because that's one of my main phrases. Think like a CEO, not like a landlord. I do not encourage people to think like a landlord. I thought like a landlord. I was collecting rent, drove me. I said, I can't do this. And I wouldn't have grown to over 30 properties if I kept thinking like a landlord. Once I start thinking like a CEO, CEO, what he does, he still rents office space or lease office space to run his business and make thousands of dollars and pay that off. Mm. You working from your house, your house is your office. Don't be, don't be mad because you don't own your office. Mm-hmm. You don't want to live. You don't. You might not want to do yard work, fix roof, worry about tenants. You might like your job, but guess what? Stable investment is still real estate. Invest in real estate. Learn that. Learn that end of LLCs and taxes. And then from there, one of my main discussions that I'm known for is how to transfer that wealth. A living trust is the most powerful thing we can have as a people. We have the, we want to build all this wealth and talk to, you, talk to each other about real estates, crypto, this and that. But yeah, okay, you die, wealth died with you. Now I'm going to leave it to my kids. So leaving it to your kids don't mean your fourth generation is going to get it. Legacy is designed in the paperwork. Show me your paperwork. A will only states that you leaving something to the immediate people right there you can see. A living trust is set up to pan down for generations over and over again. My living trust is designed to go down for at least seven, eight, nine, ten generations easily, easily. We always say generational wealth and this and that, but no. When you when we start making money, unfortunately, it turns to self wealth. We be like, yo, my baby, yo, my kids gonna be straight. Your kids could blow everything you got with a That's couple a of trips to Vegas, a bad drug habit, and gambling. Mm. You know what I mean? So why wouldn't you prepare yourself? I had uh, someone I know indirectly. He was a real estate investor. He passed away. All his properties he had, his daughters were selling his properties off for pennies on a dollar because they didn't want to be landlords. Mm. They didn't want to be landlords. $600,000 property, $300,000, $200,000 property. I, I mean, I was literally going, wow. But you know what? They didn't want to be landlords. We assume, yo, I'm going to leave my buildings to my, my, my babies. I'm going to leave all my properties. Like, oh, so you assuming this is what they want, right? So now you're not around. And they get a good they selling deal. everything off. Selling everything. Mm-hmm. A living trust, you can have a setup where, you know what? If you pass away, sell your portfolio at, at market price for this money. The kids get, let's say you got a million dollar portfolio. The kids get half a million. Spouse, they split the half a million. You also have an insurance policy in the name of your trust to pay off your mortgage. Do not rush to pay your house off. Let your insurance do that. That extra money can be an investment. So now you got the million dollars, half a million went to your family. The other half a million goes into goes into a brokerage account in the name of your trust. You put that in there, six percent interest, twenty one years. Half a million turns to two point six million. You're gonna leave that to your grandkids. Your grandkids don't get it all. They only get half, one point three. So one point three stays invested in that account for your great grandkids. Twenty one years, six percent compound interest. That turns into six point. That turns to like six point seven million. They don't get your great grandkids don't get that they could have. So now that's like 3.2. The other 3.25 stays in to get invested again. 21 years, 6% compound interest for your great, great, great grandkids. That turns into like $13 million. You feel me? And people go, well, I don't have that kind of money to start off. Yes, you do. You got the air you breathe out your lungs. It's called a life insurance policy. Get yourself a life insurance policy. Put it in the name of your trust. Divide it up the way I just broke it down to you. Now you'll be able to do the same thing. A life insurance policy. If you don't have a lot of money, get you a term for $100 a month. If you don't have a lot of money and you're going, nah, I don't want to go through all that. But key is do something. You can't do nothing. Some people, you're not inspired to be real estate investors. You're not inspired to do crypto stock. Nothing. You fine. You just want to work. I'm not mad at you. But don't just say, yo, I'm going to leave this to my kids. What are you leaving? Life insurance policy, cool. But think about your kids' kids. When you start thinking about the children you don't see, you become a way different investor. Your mm-hmm. mentality, your lenses change. That's what happened, man. When I start thinking about beyond, beyond my kids, beyond that, the scope of everything was like, yo, you wildin', bro. You got to set this up, your trust. So now I'm designing a structure to help people like us put together a trust in a simplified manner. So I'm actually working on a program, working with attorneys, so we can just do click here, click 
care because we need that. And I don't want to be the one to talk about stuff. I want to be the one to create that for us, brother. That's a fact. And, you know, <clears throat> like you said, just having that mentality, man, because people talk about generational wealth. But like I heard the term before, it's like, don't sell grandma a house. Right. It's like once grandma die, everybody balling out of control. I'm liquidating that. I don't want that. I want the cash. I'm a cash out. And yep. you're right. It's like you got to think about generations after generations, because that's how other cultures build it. You know, when yes. you look at like certain cultures, man, you see, we ain't got it. You know, when you look yes. at the black community, how many times does a dollar circulate before it leaves the community, like compared to other communities? Right. Yes. So it's like we got to start changing our mentality. Like you said, with what yo, it's on your hat, always seeking knowledge. Right. Like that's what it is. You know, yep. it starts with the mentality. You know, you can change your mind. You can change the course of your life. So man it's, it's all facts man it's crazy because some of the stuff i have for you already tapped into <laughs> i'm gonna ask you about living trust all of this <laughs> yo man I, I always try to give everybody the goods man because you know i start talking make sure you know we be two we be two hours in so i try to hurry up and tap in because you know i always got so much information to give and i try to give it in a short amount of time because i don't just don't want to be known and i tell people i'm not the guy who talks about real estate the key is i'm a legacy wealth builder you know, people say, yo, what do you consider yourself? A legacy wealth builder. I'm getting real estate. I'm teaching people LLCs and I'm teaching how to lead legacies because I'm a legacy wealth builder. I'm a teacher. I'm a motivator. I, I inspire people, but I inspire you with a purpose and a cause and an aim. That's my goal. I don't want to just give you all this and you get off, off the line. Don't know what. Now you can leave from here going, cool, my job is my business partner. So I'm already told me I got to manage my time. So I'm already told me I don't have to own real estate to own real estate. I could buy real estate or I could buy real estate and still be a renter. Don't be afraid to be that way because it's all in the mindset. Think differently. When you really let go, here's another thing. I know I'm eating up time, right? Nah, nah, nah. Yo. Listen, listen, nah. This is what it's for, bro. We have, we got time, bro. We got time. Yeah, I, yo, you say what you got to say, bro. Because yo, yo. I got a couple more points for you too, man. Keep going. All bro. right, let's go, baby. Let's do it, man. Key thing that I want to tell people also is that when you put yourself when you put yourself in this position of thinking that you have to, the only thing you can do is what you're doing now because everybody around you is doing what they're doing now, you would never be successful, man. Mm -hmm. What I mean is if you hang around three people that, that, that are losers, you're going to be the fourth. Nice. If you hang around three people that talk about dreams and never do them, you're going to be the fourth. Mm -hmm. If you hang around three successful people, you're going to be the fourth. Mm -hmm. You have to hang around people that are aiming to do something that you inspire to do. Do not inspire to be the smartest person in the room. You have to learn, no matter what you know, you wanna be in a room with people that know more and you wanna let them know that you came there to learn. If you're in a room with people and they, they talk about all kinds of things, they go, so what you do? I highly recommend the last thing, you go, look, I'm just learning, I'm sucking this all in, I greatly appreciate it, man. I'm trying to get in, I want to learn. Sound like you're humble. You know what they're gonna do? I like this guy. I like this guy. That's how I got my mentors. Straight up, humbled myself, and I knew it's going to be a learning lesson. I would have to pay for lessons, but they gave me millions of dollars worth of knowledge that got me here, and that, and I, that, I got that back. People go, "Yo, I, I got to pay for this. I, I would pay for that." And you know, people been hitting me since that, that my other interview, and I think it, it's still getting like three, four, five thousand views a day, mm -hmm. which is amazing. And I get all kinds of messages, but I told people, look, I can't check the DMs no more. I can't do that because there's so many and I'm running into people who are getting inspired, but don't want to execute. Some people nice. want to blow off steam, man. And it, you can't waste your time with people that want to blow off steam. Not everybody can be saved. Some people lives mm. are meant to crash and burn. You must let that happen and go on because their life crashing and burning will inspire 20 people around them to not be like Mm. You know what I mean? So what you what, what's your points you got for me, fam? Man, listen, man, listen, bro. Well, yo, it was a couple of things, man. Right. <laughs> One thing that that you said, man, um, I heard you say before you was like, it's smart for people to take their house out of their name. Oh, so yes. for people that's not too hip to that, they're not really familiar with game like that. Could you explain like what you mean by that? Like what type of protection does that offer? What benefits for people to take their house out of the name? Beautiful, man. Um Take your house out of your name was literally the first thing that sparked people hearing about me. Take your house out of your name means taking your, your home out of your name and placing it in a trust, right? Man, when you have your, your primary residence in your trust, you still liable, somebody slip, fall, anything. 
We do not look at it like that. We will go get a property and an LLC and go to LLC, protect me, I'm good. But then we still have our home and our name. And then when somebody falls, it's like, what? what? Mm -hmm. Protect your home. Your home is your primary asset. The home is definitely one of the, the first beginning stages of creating wealth. It is not the ultimate way and it is not the final way. It is one of the first ways of creating wealth. So when you put your home in a trust, a trust is a document that's greater than a will. The trust allows you to leave that item in the people's name who you wanted to leave it for the same as a will, but you still manage that property. You still are able to sell it. You still are able to call a shot. You're still able to do everything. It doesn't transfer over to them people until you pass away. Now, if somebody slips and fall, they can't come after the property. It's protected. Somebody tries to sue you, they can't come after the house because it's protected in the trust. But now here's where you start making profit off the trust. This is what I tell, teach people also. You now put your property in a trust. You're no longer the primary owner. So what does that mean? You could be the property manager of your home now. You can start making money off your house. Now, let me give you a perfect example. You do a renovation on your house. Money comes out your pocket. Now you write it off on your taxes. You cannot write, let me take it back. You cannot write off any renovations to your house because you're now raising the value of your home. You who just did a renovation, $50,000, can't write it off because you raised the value of your home. But let's say you're the property manager of your house now. And you say, you know what? I'm going to hire my property management company to come do the renovations on my house. Your property management company comes in. They do the renovation, spend $50,000. You paid the property management company. They did the renovations. Now you're writing off the $50,000, a portion of that $50,000 because you didn't do the work. A company mm. came in to do the work. That's Facts. the same as you hiring your own contract and company to come do the work. Facts. Facts. Now you're paying. It's writing off all those things and learning the game. When mm. we when it, when people say things like, um, not even I, you know I want I'm gonna use a better example. Do we think that Jeff Bezos has his house in his name, his cars in his name? Do we think Jay Z got his houses in his name, his cars in your name? Even though he said we don't we don't lease, we own. That was an old J. You ask him right. now. <laughs> <laughs> that was OJ. This is business J now. <laughs> nothing is in his, nothing. Nothing is in their names. Nothing at all. You know why? Because it's a write off and it's protection. Uh, the, the reason why you take your house out your name is one of the most important things to do to protecting it and learning how to benefit off of that. The more and more you learn the business sides of things, the more business savvy you be, the more money you'll make and the more you'll think creative. Like having your children, once you do have your home office, you have your children work for your LLC. You could, you could pay your child through your LLC. And I did another video for give your kids a salary and not an allowance. Where now mm. if they're doing chores around the house, you could write that off as a tax write-off because your office is in the house and now they're cleaning up your office doing chores around the house and your office is one of them. You could write that off. Mm. Now, well, let me ask you, Stone, what's the max? What's the max that you can right. offer them? Most states like New York, I think the max is twelve or 13000 a year. Okay. So now you take off 13000 off the money that you're going to be writing off on taxes. It's crazy. Think about that. Crazy. Now you just lowered your, your income for your taxes. And now here's another thing. Your kids doing taxes. They're going to do taxes. So a lot of times they can actually get a tax return check. That's and here's crazy. more game. You got them working for your LLC. You open up them a 401k under their name. They put about $40 a week consistently for four years. Don't you know by the time they reach 50 years old, they have over a million dollars there that can't be taxed because they opened it up when they was a minor? This is wow. the stuff they do. Wow. See what I'm saying? This is the game. So wow. this is all the stuff like, I could talk to you about real estate all day, but am I really changing your life? Am I really increasing the knowledge of stuff you haven't heard before? Like mm -hmm. I bought properties also that I've never seen. For those, I'm beyond real estate for me is beyond the growth where I was able to grow Buying properties in Brooklyn was cool. Made money, cool. The people hear about those, yo, that works million, that's worth two, that's how he made his money. No, that's not how I make my money. Before I explain the 30 properties, let me explain to you how those properties now worth all this money didn't make me money. Because my property is worth, let's say $2 million. I said a $2 million mortgage is worth $10,000, but the rent is still only 2,500. Mm. How am I paying a $10,000 mortgage if I was to refinance that house? How? The rent's not equating to that. Mm -hmm. So that you don't refi, right? So people, of course, there's money in there I could take out to do things with, but why would I now do that if I'm going to sell the property? Like you have to have a plan. But when I started buying properties out of state five years ago that I never had to go see, that's what got me in. That's what changed my life and changed my mind. 
I started buying properties. I'm in six or seven states. I'm in Alabama. I'm in Georgia. I'm in Milwaukee, Indianapolis, Florida. I'm in Ohio. All of these properties I've never seen. I've built teams together. That right there is a CEO mentality. A CEO have an office with a lot of people working. Do we think he goes to each door making sure everybody's doing their job? That's self-sufficient. My properties run themselves. Only time I need to go knock on the door is when I find out it's not making money. And I go, yo, what's going on with this asset? You release the word property and you obtain the word asset. It releases the emotion from the property because mm. it's an asset to me. I sell properties within five years. When people say, oh, I'm going to buy these properties, I'm going to have it for about at least 30 years. Why are you thinking about 30 years on a property? It, mm. unless it's your primary properties eventually break down they eventually need fixing x caps why would you even consider holding a property for that long mm. you know it's an asset get it make cash flow buy the property and i always i teach this buying properties that are cash flowing immediately with tenants in there i will buy a property with a tenant living there three four years consistent rent never been late before i buy vacant property because i don't know that new tenant's rent history Mm. I don't know what he's going to do. But if I know, if you came to me and said, Storm, I got, I got an asset. These people have, these people have a, a loan out on this asset, a business loan, and they're paying it back every year for the last three years. I'm selling this asset. Storm is a guaranteed 20% return on the asset. You ain't telling me it's a property. Mm. I'm selling this business. I just want to get me a bigger business. Storm, you interested in making 20% this much, this much? They've never been laid on payments. I'm going to sell it to you for this much. I'm going to go, damn, you selling your business? Back. Let me mm. buy that business. Mm -hmm. That's smart, man. That's genius, man. And let me ask you this too, Storm, in terms of like when you're picking up these properties, what's like the exit strategy? Like in your mind, when I know you say you don't want to hold it too long because eventually right. the property, it starts to fall apart. So mentally for you, when you pick up that property, what's like, do you got a number in your mind to say, yo, after I bought this property, after such and such amount of time, this is the amount of dollars I want to make on it before I just get rid of it. Like what, what's your mentality when you're doing that? My exit strategy is always based on how the property is performing. Okay. If I can raise the rent or like section eight, which is one of my primary things. And I tell people change your mentality on section eight from the New York and big city mentality. I have at least 12 properties. I was section eight and all of them are nice properties. The lawns are nice because these people don't live on top of each other. These are single families, duplexes. They don't have the headaches we got trying to find parking. Kid next door fighting with your kid here. Everybody's gang. Like, it's, you know, all that stuff. Sound that like, that sound like Brooklyn, Queens in the Bronx to me. You feel me? This is why we <laughs> had those nightmares, right? right? So when I buy these properties, long as the properties are still performing well, mm -hmm. I don't worry about it. But I know I'm not going to stay past five years, period. I don't care what it's doing. Because that's when right. you start having furnace breakdown rules and things of that nature. So I would sell the property just to now buy another asset to start doing the same thing. But within five years, if I'm making 20% off my money, if I'm making 20% off a $20,000 investment, dude, that's 20%. So that's $4,000 a year for five years. I made, I made 20,000. Mm. I made 20,000 off of 20,000. Now, if you do that five or six times, you can make $100,000 easy mm. without getting caught up in the emotion of, yo, oh man, now I got to do I'm a master. I'm out of state. I don't want to deal with ringing no bells. I don't want to nice. collect no rent from tenants. I had it where tenants would call me three, four in the morning. They locked out. Keys can't get in. Mm -hmm. I had issues with tenants. This. Like, why would you want to give yourself another job if you already have a job? Mm -hmm. Time Value your time. Because it, the main thing that stops people from buying more properties is the headache they can have from one. I, there was one time I bought eight properties in one month and I didn't even know I bought eight. I was buying them so fast because I was wow. buying them out of state and I was just, they, they just comfort, they're assets. So my exit strategy is definitely max five years. But as soon as I see there's starting to be an issue with the asset, I let go of the asset and obtain a new asset. That's genius, man. That's genius. And for the people that's listening, that they're not familiar with real estate, you know, they, they trying to get into it. Cause I think a lot of times people think like monetarily, I just can't afford this. You know, like they look at their, their monthly bills, all the obligations they got to say, listen, mm -hmm. man, that's unattainable. Like on average, like for the average person, how much would it cost them on average to say, hey, if I want to get in this real estate game, what do you think roughly that would, that would look like? You know what I'm saying? I'll give you a perfect example. I bought a property in, I think it was in Indianapolis, this one I bought, right? This one was $40,000. Section eight was paying like 800, 800, 900 dollars. 
I got a mortgage from a local bank, community bank for the 40,000. My down payment was $8,000 and I got $600 for closing fees. So it was $8,600 wow. for me to buy a $40,000 house. So now I put down, let's say $9,000. So let's do 9,000. Um, 9,000 and the rent was 900 section eight. The mortgage was $350. So I was cash flowing $450. So $450, 12 months. I made my $9,000 back in one year, mm. one year. Now let's do a hundred thousand dollar house. I tell savings accounts, 401k and tax returns. It's all you need. Pick one. You got a 401k bar from yourself. Tax mm. return. You got a hundred thousand dollar house costs you $20,000, $20,000. I know you can get a $20,000 house. And if not, guess what? You got somebody who think like you, partner, y'all go 10,000 a piece. Even if you do have $20,000 to buy one house, I tell people, find somebody else. And now you put in 10, they put in 10. And now guess what? Y'all buy two houses. And mm -hmm. now when you do your taxes, you're writing off two properties instead of one. Your mm -hmm. portfolio grows. My mentor told me when I start buying property, he said, yo, you're doing your thing. But when you learn to value your partner, you're going to grow. I was like, nah, I'm good. Once I start partnering, my portfolio went, because I wasn't buying one property. I was buying three properties, partnering mm -hmm. one person, getting three instead of one. Now mm -hmm. doing my taxes looking incredible. Do we think of a person who has wealth? You see all these big units, million dollar projects here, million dollar here, that's one investor? No, they go get other investors. Mm -hmm. Now they go, instead of my million, I put 200,000 on that one, 200,000 on that one. 200,000 on that one. I get five investments for 200,000 instead of putting my million in one mm. instead of one property. And now when they do their taxes, they got five properties gaining equity, writing off five situations Crazy. instead of that $1 million. So Crazy. for you to get in there and it easily be you saving up your savings account, your 401k or tax return, or get you a partner. But it's easy. It's not mm. hard. See, when we live in these places where the properties are 800, 900, 400,000, we're like, yo, man, this shit is crazy. But there's a whole middle America mm. where properties all day you could buy for $80,000, mm. $60,000. That's $15,000 to buy a $60,000 property right there. And remember, you're thinking like a CEO, so you're never going to go see it. You're going to have a managed property, so not properly. And then once you do that, you're going to go, oh, shit, I bought this property. And once you see that money coming in, you're going to go, oh, shit, I can do this again because I'm not doing nothing. Now you keep rinse, wash, repeat, rinse, wash, repeat. A lot of times people rinse, wash, then they go, all right, all right. They waiting for something to happen. <laughs> or there's so much going on with the tenant and a headache, mm -hmm. they don't do it again, man. But now nah, it, it's easy to get in real estate. Here's another thing though, real quick. You must learn to take your investments from your real estate and invest in the future and invest in technology. The mm -hmm. days of just saying, I'm gonna collect my cash flow in real estate and chill, that's, that's primitive thinking. You can't say, yo, I'll make my money and I'm going to sit and chill. Take that money and invest. People who do who have been investing for a while, they've been like, yo, just buy property and just go off the equity and chill. But yeah, why would you just let that cash flow sit there if you know you can invest in the technology of what's happening? We see where it's going. We see the different things about computers, metaverse, technology, chips, driverless cars. That ain't going nowhere. That mm -hmm. train is coming. Whether you're getting on or getting hit by it, the choice is yours. Do you it's think coming. you're going to wake up one day and Amazon is gone? Apple's gonna, Apple not going nowhere. Amazon's not going nowhere. These technologies are not going nowhere. They partnering. Mm -hmm. So that right there has made me so much more money investing in Netflix and all this stuff like that because I ain't letting my cash flow sit. I'm just flipping that to another stream, another revenue stream of cash flow. Man, that's that's fine. You know, and like people talk about three streams of income, right? Active income, passive income, portfolio income. So just diversifying, like you said, you know, making sure that you got different things. Like even people that do stocks, right? It's like, all right, you know, I might have some Amazon. I got some Apple. I got some Tesla. I got a mixed bag. So if something starts underperforming, I got something that can carry that, right? It's like yeah. a basketball team. You know, if your point guard is having a terrible game, maybe your small forward going to pull up, right? And drop 50 for you. Yeah. Right. So that's what it is, man. So definitely, man, that, that's fire, man. Question I have for you, Storm. So we ask every guest on the show this question, man. And that question is, what is your mantra? So for me personally, my mantra is persistence, wears down resistance. So that's yeah. that's my mentality. Like no matter what's going on, you know, whatever the obstacle, the challenge, just to keep 
on going, you know, just right. keep that killer mentality. So what's your mentality? What's your mantra that's kept you throughout the years, man? You know, just kept you just focused, just grinding, you know? Wow. Um, I, you know, it's so funny because I have a couple, but I'm going to just keep it simple. And it's one that you probably heard before. My thing was, um, you know, we came here for like when you see people rob a bank. They go and you watch a movie, people rob the bank. They go in there and they take bundles off the shelf. You see money falling. They don't go back for that money falling on the floor. So that's my whole thing. When I come here, we came here, we came to get the money on the shelves, not the dollars falling on the floor. And those dollars falling on the floor are management fees, uh, um, property management fees, agent fees. Like people get worn down by saying, oh, I got to pay all these people to do these things. Yeah, but if you're paying somebody 5%, for you to make 95% or if you're giving somebody 20% for you to make 80, that's the mindset. Because if you want to do 100% of managing that one property, you're losing your time management to go buy more properties again, right? People always ask me that, yo, how much these management fees cost you? I said, they cost me 10%, but guess what I'm getting from that 10% to go make me another 80 or 90%, another 80, 90, 90, 90, 90. Stop mm -hmm. trying to make it all. When you learn mm -hmm. to divide that time with somebody else, because time management is the key. Mm -hmm. Learn to manage your time. When you learn to get you, an, if you need an assistant or people, whatever, you free your mind up for growth. There's mm -hmm. something that I've, I've learned, and I, and I know I'm going deep on this on this part. But go real deep, quick. man, go deep, bro. <laughs> when <laughs> I got think? into this whole thing of real estate, and, and I heard this phrase is like the conversation of billionaires. I always tell people, because that's where I, I heard it from, millionaires and billionaires. When you want to start your own business and you hands on, you're a thousandaire. That's my term. You're a thousandaire. You're making money. You're running your business. You're a thousandaire. But once you want to go into that millionaire stage, now you're delegating duties. You still got your business, but you're delegating people to go do stuff. Like me, I dealt, once I was a landlord, I was making thousands. But once I started delegating property management, doing this, doing that, I became a millionaire. I'm not doing nothing, but now I got the vision. So they go do it. But now when you want to become a billionaire, you strictly visionary. You become a complete visionary. You have your vision. You find one person, give them your vision, and now they do the delegating. They do the delegating. Think of, think of Elon Musk, his vision of the Tesla. Think about how he took his, his money from PayPal, 300 million, whatever it was, and said, you know what? I'm going to start me an electric car company. He didn't even buy him a house. Think about mm. think about homeboy who 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 did um swipe and Twitter. Like think about think about Jeff Bezos, the vision to go to space. Think about Pierre Brock. Like these people brain are visionaries. They have people that who are so close to them, they say, Look, I got this vision. You take it, put the team together, because I got another vision I'm gonna go work on over here. Mm. You have to you have to define those levels with your growth. And it starts with realizing. You can't make all the money if you want to make all the money, mm. right? Mm. So that's where that phrase, I go take bundles off the shelf, but the stuff falling on the floor allows me to go become a billionaire. Mm. That's a fact, man. And you know, just like you said, being able to delegate because there's only but so much time in a day. So as you start to climb that ladder of success, certain things you have to be able to delegate to the right people to say, hey man, I need you to do this, A, B, C, D, execute that we can keep it moving while I'm doing this over here. Because like yeah. you said, man, yo, that's important, man. Having the right people in the right positions, you know? And I think too, also like not being afraid to promote and demote when it's necessary. I think a lot of times, yes. you know, people got their homeboys, their homegirls, their aunties, their uncles. Cause that's a lot of times the people that they reach out to first, cause it's familiar. It's like, well, you know, I heard my auntie do whatever you know let me bring home but then auntie slack and she ain't really on a grind then you feel bad because it's you're not auntie. running a business right you're not right. running a business you see thinking like a ceo you're not thinking like ceo now mm -hmm. you know you can't save everybody mm -hmm. and you and you'll be surprised how many people you put on that never believe you could make it anyway mm. yeah realistically oh he doing that little thing over there let's see how let's see how that little real estate thing work out oh he doing it Oh my God. Oh, that's exactly how they do it. Nephew, too. cousin, I need you to help me with this. I need you to help me with this. You know what I mean? The same ones you ain't here from. Yeah. That's Feel a me? Fact. So, no, you got to run your business like a business. You leave them over there. They need help with something. You want to give them some bread? That's on you. But a lot of the times, 
you will, you will save a lot of money by giving them money to go do what they what they want to do and go in the fail because now you gave them a shot. You will lose a lot of money keeping people on that you knew you never should have had in the first place around you. That's a fact, man. Let me ask you something. Did you experience that once you was able to leave your job with some of the workers and the bosses? Like, did some of those people, like, because I, I know you, you know, you had mentioned like your last day, you know, when you went in there and it was like, you know, yeah, everything is like, yo, what's going on? It's like my last day, right? So did you experience that? Like after that, like a lot of people, did you find from your old job, they was reaching out like, yo, man, I'm, I'm trying to get free too, man. Like, what, what was that like, man? You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's funny because when I was there, and I was planning my escape, you know, and this is one thing I learned. You can't talk to people about freedom if all they're talking about is they got to go to work on Monday. Mm. Like, and I was talking to people about freedom. I was talking about like, yo, I'm, got, I'm, I'm, I'm doing these houses. I'm doing my set out of state. Like, I'm doing this. Like, I was breaking out the plan. That, and it was like, yeah, oh, we, oh, sure. <laughs> You'll be right here with us. Oh, you know what I mean? And then I was working, yeah. at, <laughs> working the system how they gave me. So I took time off and I was working it, working with COVID hit, working it, working it. And I was like, I'm out. Went in with my ASK hat on. I went there, they saw me coming in. It's like, yo, you back to work? I was like, you think I came back to work like this? I can't because I'm out. I had that joint on Instagram live and I left. So now, yeah, several people have reached out to me. They sent me a little message like, yo, I'm proud of you this. Yo, I'm thinking about doing this. How do I do this with this house? How do I do that? You know what I, you know what I do on the strength? I would give people a little time. Like I would give them that conversation once. And this is something we all must implement. Give people that one shot to have your attention. You know why? Because when they don't do anything with it, now they're going to hesitate and go, damn, I ain't do that last shit he told me to do. I can't even call him no more. Facts. I can't. Facts. It's like loaning somebody money. If you want somebody to leave you alone, and you got <laughs> money, you know, you don't, you can, you can stand and lose that 500, that thousand, loan them that money. They'll never call you for more money because they sell you a thousand. That's what mm -hmm. I do with my information. I said, I'm going to give them 20 minutes, 30 minutes. Talk. Yo, do this. Do that. 100%. And I tell them, look, I'm telling you, you don't do it. It's on you. But I mm -hmm. gave you the gem on how to do it. They never hear from them again. Mm -hmm. You know why? Because they already set. You can't tell an adult how to be an adult. Some people and a lot of them already dictate where they're going to go. And unfortunately, it has a lot to do with their household. Their mm -hmm. household would tell them they spouse you know, other people that like, I understand you can't risk it all. I didn't risk it all. I stayed at my job and did what I had to do, but they have it. Now you don't need to do this. And I had a cousin who was in real estate. My brother bought real estate and he tried to do this and he tried to do that. But yeah, but they did it wrong. You know what I mean? So now they already putting that seat in, you know, I, I've been in a situation where fortunately for me, when I was younger, when I went to get in my first property back in 99, 2000, I was I was married then, and I got out of that got out of that marriage because we didn't agree. It's like mm -hmm. I got divorced because I said, you know what, she want me to work forever. Mm -hmm. I said, you so know she what? didn't. So she didn't see the vision. Kind of was it like she, she was just like, yo, vision. just work this job, you know. Mm. Yep, and I had to make a choice. One of the best decisions I ever made, hardest decision, mm -hmm. hardest decision. I tell. Did you have kids or you had kids or? Yeah, I, I, had, I, had a, I had a brand new one. Wow, wow, that was tough. Yeah, but you know what? Everybody moved on because now look at her life. Yeah, she's happy. She's doing her thing, and look where I'm at. I yeah. could easily still been up there. Oh, we <laughs> now my days till I retire. Yeah, you feel me? But now yeah. look, I'm out, and she have everybody. Everybody's doing a good thing. So I'm not telling nobody to walk away from this situation because some mm -hmm. of y'all is like a screw, like a relationship. Your brand new relationship is the screw. You screw it in, you hang the picture. If it don't work out, you can take the picture off and unscrew the screw and pick compound. But now once you get married. Now you got the screw that has the plastic in it. So now you screw it in, you take it down. If you try to take it down, now that plastic one is a little harder, but you can take it out and fill it in with some plaster. But now when you have kids, now is that screw with the butterfly in the back. Yeah. Now that butterfly one, you can't unscrew that. You got to rip the wall and make a big hole. You feel me? So there's different levels to this. <laughs> I know my analogies, man. But it's true. Yeah. So you gotta be like deciding at what point you want to bust this wall now. That's and I right. said, I got the plastic, I can fix that. But I mm. couldn't get once I knew it, it started getting butterflies and you know what I mean? So I'm not telling nobody that. But what I'm saying is understand you need to make a, a, a conscious decision of what you do and who you do it with, whether it be relationship or partners and business. Business, business, business. 
figure that out. That's that's pretty much it. Man. That's a fact. That's a fact. Well, the last thing I have for you, Storm, man, it's, this has been phenomenal, man. This is like crazy, bro. <laughs> you yo, killed it, bro. We appreciate you, man. Um, So for all the listeners, man, that they want to tap in with you and like, because I know you got the course, man, the, the mentorship and everything. How can they reach out to you? In regards to that, also like in terms of just like social media, like what's your yeah. social media platforms? Like get, lay it on them, man. 100%. You can find me Instagram. I am Storm Leroy. And also what I'm encouraging everybody to do is go to my YouTube, Storm Leroy. I'm going to be doing free masterclass and free training on YouTube consistently, weekly, teaching you everything. Like I'm going to open up the doors and I'm going to have a class on there. This is something I want to do because, like I said, my main goal is to teach, 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 and give you the knowledge. And I say, you know what, Storm? You got to take some stuff out that courses and give it to people who can't afford the course. So join my YouTube, follow my YouTube, encourage other people to, um, you know, Facebook, same thing, Storm Leroy. And I, I look forward to a lot of you guys coming in. I appreciate the time of you having me here. I'm currently doing, um, I have the book being done. My course is called The Employed Millionaire. The employed millionaire because it's teaching you how to have your job and become a millionaire. Mm. So it's a course consisting of out-of-state investing, LLC structuring, and the power of a living trust. And you can get that at employedmillionaire.com. Mm. Fire, fire, man. So listen, all y'all tapping, man. Y'all heard it, man. Storm, man. He just he laid it out, man. It's it's my guy, man. This this brother's don't dynamic, doubt, man. Really. You know what I'm saying? Like real talk. Definitely, man. Definitely. So we just looking forward to great things, man. And as always, man, you know, Diagnosis Success Podcast. Appreciate y'all tapping in as always, man. Just always strive for success.